inspired moneymaker, Forbes called today's guest the new Benjamin Graham. His thoughts on value investing, art, and life have generated a following. We're about to get a how to on investing and living a meaningful life. Episode 257 features Vitaly Katzenelson, author, CEO, value investor. Either you make hundred thousand dollars and spend sixty, or you make five million dollars and spend seven. You know you will be wealthier at the end when you make hundred thousand dollars and say, you know and save you know, and spend sixty because you're gonna to keep saving forty thousand dollars a year, and you're gonna invest over a period of time. It's gonna compound. It's gonna and you're gonna accumulate wealth. I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money Podcast, where we share positive perspectives on money so we can have a bigger impact in our community and in the world. This episode is brought to you by my company, Runnymede Capital Management. We're talking value investing today, which is a little bit different from my work. At Runnymede, we invest in growth companies, companies with consistent or accelerating earnings, and we have price targets so that we can buy stocks at the right price. We also do a lot of market cycle work where we assess risk in the stock market. Our goal is to be defensive ahead of financial hurricanes, and we have a pretty good record of doing so. We sent out financial hurricane alerts to clients in 1999 and 2008. This year, we officially called a hurricane alert on our April 2022 client conference call. That's when the S&P was down just 5% for the year. If you want insights into our market outlook, go subscribe to my email that goes out every two weeks. The Running Meet Investment team highlights data, news, and events that we think are worth sharing. Subscribe at inspiredmoney.fm newsletter. It's free and informative. We're talking with Vitaly Katzen-Nelson today, Chief Investment Officer and CEO at Investment Management Associates. He's author of The Little Book of Sideways Markets and Active Value Investing. He's a self-proclaimed student of life who loves playing chess and writing about life, investing, and classical music. His latest book is entitled Soul in the Game, The Art of a Meaningful Life. While some say it's his first non-investment book, Vitaly says it's a book about investing in your life perhaps the most important investment you can make. In this episode, you'll learn about how Vitaly approaches value investing, why a daily writing practice can make you a better investor and a better human being. And stay tuned to the end to hear about stoic philosophy, an operating system for life. Now let's get inspired with Vitaly Katzenelson. Vitaly, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Andy, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Um, I think I was about six or seven years old. I have an older brother, my oldest brother, who is 10 years older. I wanted to buy this toy, I think a tank or something. And my parents wouldn't buy it for me. And my brother was going to buy it for me using his own money. And uh, I remember it was like five rubles or something. And uh, that's the first time I remember that money bought things. That made an impression. Um, yeah, no, the, yeah, see, it was in Soviet Russia at the time. And uh, so you see, in the, in the, in, in, see, when you grow up in the, uh, when I was growing up in Soviet Russia, having money was not enough because you had to have connection to be able to buy things. Uh, it does not relate to my toy in this case, but in general, I mean, you, my parents had money, but there was no food in stores. So uh, it didn't matter if you had money, uh, you couldn't buy anything, you know, you know there was, you know, you couldn't buy food. So uh, yeah, so the, uh, when you grew up in a capitalistic society, money usually solves a lot of problems. Well, it, in the, in Soviet Russia, it you know it did not solve a lot of problems. You know it solved part some of the problems, but not all of them. Interesting, Vitaly, you're very thoughtful about investing. You've written four books and many many newsletters. People keep trying to call a market bottom here. Where do you think we are in this financial market cycle? Oh, I have a good answer. From this point, 
and you have to write it down, this, this point, the market will either go up, down, or sideways. Um, in all honesty, um, when you watch TV and you have uh, these people who are extremely self-confident and telling you oh, this is the bottom or market is going higher or going lower, they sound like they know the answer and they don't because nobody does. Market is, well, first of all, economy is a very complex system. And it's incredibly difficult to know what the economy is going to do over the next three months, six months, a year. Trying to figure out what the market is going to do is even more difficult because you have no idea how the market will react to the, uh, to the economy that you can't predict. So you have to predict a reaction to something you can't know. You, you have to forecast the reaction to something you can't predict. So I spend very little time thinking about what the, what the market is going to do next. Well, each time is different. If you look at the market crashes, right? It's like 2000, you had speculation of internet companies, no valuation. 2008, we had a financial crisis. So each time's a little bit different. So as you're correct, it, it's very challenging to try to predict because there are so many variables. Yeah, so there are certain things that kind of rhyme throughout history, like the dot-com bubble of 1999 just repeated, you know, you know, just repeated again, you know, last year. So, but you don't know when it's going to burst. I mean, you could have predicted it's going to burst three years ago and it didn't and just got, you know, so it's very difficult to predict, th you know, to predict these things. I'm, it's almost like one of the questions should not be asked by an investor because I think we are so much better off just, and that's what we do, is just focusing on valuing individual companies and analyzing individual companies. That is something where I would argue you can add value, but predicting what the market is going to do next, it's a, uh, it consumes a huge amount of energy, and it's a, I would argue your predictive power is very very low. So so that's why I don't ask this question. Um, I guess if you think about it, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to try to get a little bit philosophical about things. Um, but it's very important to figure out what not to do as to what to do by not, by basically not doing certain things, you save a huge amount of energy and that allows you to get, buys you time and energy to focus on something what you should be doing. So what I argue, so I would argue just don't focus on the market and just focus on the individual stocks. And uh, the time you save trying to predict what the market does, just put it to better use. Get a hobby. Start skiing like you and I do. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're very much a bottom-up guy. You say that investing is an incredible intellectual riddle. Yes. What do you love about it? And that's exactly what I love about this. It's a, imagine it's a journey that has no end. A journey where you can, when you keep learning all the time and, and uh, the learning process never ends, that it never gets boring because like I just, I would be terrified if I was a doctor and I was specializing on the left knee replacement. Okay, just if that's all I did because after a while, that just becomes a craft, okay? I mean, it's a very important craft, don't get me wrong. I wish I had a doctor who, like if I need it ever, who specializes just on the replacement left knees, okay? And that person would be so good at this. Yeah, and I would be very thankful to him. But for my, but in investing, there is, there is an art and craft component to this. And you can, and this art component is that what basically makes it interesting and exciting and uh, and a terrific learning experience so uh yeah and so that's that's what i love about the real the riddle that's never ends can you give us a little insight into your process like what it looks like when you have a new investment idea and you start doing the research sure so New idea comes to me, and uh, something about this idea intrigues me. 
it's maybe the management or maybe the quality of the business. No, 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 no matter what it is, I start. I usually uh, pull up any report, start start reading any report. I may listen to uh, some of the company's uh, presentations. Um, you know, I try. You know, I kind of look for interviews with the company CEO, this kind of thing. So I do a lot of soft work first, trying to understand if I kind of, I like the business. I may talk to some of my friends who may know something more about this industry than I do. And then it's a, um, then I may read the uh, expert research reports, like interviews with uh, competitors of this company uh, or people who used to work for the company. It's a kind of, it's a, it's over, every time it's going to be a little bit different because every time the company may arrive, you know, the idea may arrive, come to me from different directions and therefore that will trigger how I look at it. Um, but, you know, then at some point, like, you know, I will talk to my analysts and I'll ask my analyst uh, to focus on a specific issue. Then we'll start building a financial model. You know, if, we, if the more interested we get, the more deeper we're going to go. But at the end of it, you know, we build financial models. We try to stress test the, you know, uh, uh, comp company's financials, its valuation. We would talk to competitors. We would talk to, to the management. Um, it depends. And also, it's, a lot of times it depends how well I know the business. If we own something in the past, it's going to take me a lot less time to understand the business. Also, let me use this analogy on you. Okay. When you read sci-fi novels, one thing the author has to do, has to build the world, right? Because it's, you know, like in the sci-fi, it happens not in today's society, not in this world. It happens in a very different world. Now, when I analyze a company or an industry that's a completely brand new to me, I have to build this world. I need to understand what drives this industry, what metrics I should be paying attention to, you know, what are the competing products, this kind of things. So it depends on the, like the, the amount of work we do up front is going to depend of how familiar we are with this company, this industry, et cetera, and how much world building we have to do. I like looking at a company's earning stream. Like usually the foundation of my investing approach is that earnings matter, that if I can invest in a company, if I can identify and invest in companies that are delivering consistent earnings growth, the stock price should be correlated over time. What do you look for as far as like being a value investor? Are you looking for the earnings? Are you looking for turnarounds? What kind of what kind of names do you like to find and own? I, th I find investing is a lot more nuanced than the way you just described. Let me give you one example. You would think that the stock price would correlate with companies' earnings growth. And you are kind of right, except it really does make a difference how much you pay for those earnings, right? Um, I would give you an example. Um, my first two books focus on this issue. And especially like, like if, you, if you're listening to this podcast, I would encourage you to listen or read um, the little book of Sideways Markets. It's a very short book. It's going to take you five hours and 47 minutes to, uh, to listen to it. Uh, and um, if you bought Walmart in 1999, over the next, and I'm roughly recalling the numbers, over the next 12 years of, you know, the Walmart grew earnings about 11, 12% a year. So you would think the stock price would follow the earnings, right? Well, the stock price has basically has gone nowhere for 12 years. Why? Because in 1999, Walmart was very expensive and the earnings growth all it did is just compressed the very high valuations of the of Walmart stock. So the Walmart stock's valuation went at the time, I don't know, from 45 or 50 times earnings to 15. So in the very, very, very long run, much longer run than most people have, 
um, you know, the uh, uh, company's earning, uh, company stock price will follow earnings. But it means that if you if you mindlessly buy in just on the premise, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but I'm just you know I'm saying that's the fallacy of that. If, you, if that's all you do, then you may subject yourself to decades of nothingness. Even 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 if you get the earnings right. So, I to answer your question, what kind of companies we usually buy? We buy high quality companies and we buy them cheap. I am not. If there is a turnaround, I have to be ecstatic about the management, and management has to like. I'm not, I'm not a big fan in general of turnarounds. It's not something we do a lot. There are exceptions, but. We usually, when, the way we get into turnarounds is that when we buy a company and we misjudge something and it becomes a turnaround. But in general, we try we try to stay away from turnarounds. It just, that's not, you know, we buy it at times, but rarely. Um, um, I just want to buy high quality companies and I want to buy it, you know, when, it's, when they're undervalued. Now, this is important, is that well, first of all, we need to define what quality means. What is quality? Well, quality is three things, okay? The kind of three general buckets, business, balance sheet, and management, okay? Like, what is a great business? I mean, there are so many ways to define it, but like Warren Buffett gave it this very good definition. And that's it. It's, a, it's not a definition, it's a test. A quality company you can buy and not be able to sell for 10 years. If the market, you know, the stock market gets you know, closed for 10 years and you can't sell it and you and you have no worry in the world about the business. So that's a, that's kind of definition of quality overall. But um, but good business to us, company has competitive advantage, high return on capital. Uh, it's a uh, run by good management. And good management, when we think about management, we need to, we're looking for two things, and those are two distinct analysis. How the management runs the business and how well they allocate capital. And then we also look at balance sheet. Um, and again, this is a nuanced analysis as well because some companies should have no debt at all. Some companies Hard to find have, nowadays. Huh? It's harder. It's harder to find these days than it used to be. Well, it's true, true. I, I mean, think with cheap really, money, right? Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. But let's say I would argue that a company, a cable company, can afford to have a lot more debt because of the high recurrence of revenues and because of low concentration of its customers. Um, I would ask. I, I would argue that um, a retailer should have a lot less debt. You know, especially fashion retailer, because just because the business, you know, is so much more cyclical, so much more fickle, and you're gonna have, uh, and you're gonna have periods of times where the company makes from making a lot of money to losing money, and you need the balance sheet to to survive through that. Um, so it's again, it's a nuanced discussion because it's not a like it would be silly for me to say I don't buy companies that have any debt. Well. That's not, you know, that's, that would be a very uh, dogmatic analysis on my part. Um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of, you know, and then the last point is this. So this is, we just talked about the business. Let's talk about valuation. Um, so there is a, like, when you think about traditional value investors, and when I say traditional, kind of stereotypical value investors, they consider that those are people who buy companies that trade at eight, 10 times earnings. Okay. Um, well, I would argue that this is micro, mis, uh, you, mischaracterization of value investing. Value investing is a lot more than that. Um, this kind of analysis just focuses on earnings that are right in front of you, staring you in the face. But what about a company that have a sustainable competitive advantage and is growing earnings at a very fast pace. And you are very comfortable that they can continue to do this for a long period of time. Well, these companies will rarely look statistically cheap. But as you just described, if you buy this company right at the right price, this earnings growth will create a lot of value. So when, so in our analysis, 
we start this by looking at earnings four years out, always. Why do we do this? Because if I have a company that has a higher earnings growth and I'm comfortable with that, th then this company, this, this capital I have, you know, either buying this company will be competing with another company that may be growing earnings at a slower growth, a slower rate. And therefore, because I'm looking at four years out, these two companies will be competing against each other and the company is growing uh, earnings at a slower rate. It's going to have to have a larger discount to its fair value to make it my portfolio. So it's a very nuanced discussion. Uh, in general. So I own companies that look statistically cheap staring you in the face. And I also look companies that look statistically expensive, but we think they're undervalued because they're, they have a, you know, they are inexpensive or there was, you know, they, they traded the discount based on the earnings four or five years out. It's very interesting. I, I suspect that there's quite a bit of overlap in the way that we look at companies, even though you get labeled as a value investor. And often I'm, I'm called growth at the right price. But I think that when you look at the analysis and what you want to own, probably we're looking at a lot of the same metrics. It's oh, just sure. that the investment community wants to put everybody in a box and they call something a little bit different. I actually, I would argue it's not an investment community. It's it's an army of uh, it's an army of um, MBAs uh, consultants that need to justify Correct. their existence. And uh, so, yeah. Okay, so tell me this: you write two hours every morning. How does that make you a better investor and portfolio manager? Well, let's start with this: that this is not the only goal of my life. My goal for life is also to be a good, sentient human being. So it makes me a better human being first. But it does make me a better investor because it makes me... When you write something, it forces you to... to see the broken links in your thinking. So when you think you understand something, when you start writing it, you find that you didn't understand it as well as you thought you did. And you start identifying those broken um, logical links and you discover them through, you know, through writing process. Uh, so it also makes me a better, just a better human being because I, I tend to think, so. I tend to think more about issues than other people do just because I, I, I actively think two hours a day. That makes sense. I, I imagine that it makes you a better communicator too. Well, you be the judge. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but, 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 but in general, yes. And let me tell you why, because a lot of times when, when, I, when I'm asked a question or when I say something and I thought it through, I already have a logical link of what I want to say laid out. And I already, you know, when I wrote it, I already wrote, uh, chose the words that are precisely explain what I want to say. And therefore, it makes, for me at least, it makes uh, uh, communicating much easier. I would imagine that it would help a lot when you need to communicate with your clients or communicate with your wife. Clients for sure. Um, they, uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, well, there, there's a, there's so many benefits to writing. One of them, there is a tremendous leverage, meaning that I write letters to clients. I spent almost, um, like a few years ago, I, I was spending maybe on the high side, 30 hours a year talking to clients. Now that number is even less than that. And the reason for that because I write very long letters to clients and and uh, in uh, in depth letters after they're done reading the letters I you know the, the letter describes them 
what I think about the economy, what if you think about what we're doing and this kind of thing. And says, we bought Microsoft, here's why. We sold IBM, here's why. It walks you through every decision we made in the portfolio. After clients done reading this letter, they have no questions for me. Now, because my company has, I think we have, about, we have about 300, 350 clients. If I had to talk to every client and explain them you know, what's going on in their accounts, et cetera, I would spend 700 hours you know, a year. That's one third of my time. You know, uh, I spend a fraction, tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of that. And so writing allows me to, you know, kind of to communicate at much greater scale. If number, if you double number of clients, the amount of time I spend in communication to client will not increase that much. That's really cool. I want to talk about your new book, Soul in the Game. All right. Can you? Can you start by differentiating skin in the game versus soul in the game? Yeah. No, so first of all, my first, you said I wrote four books and I can see where you're coming from. So I wrote two books on investing, one, one tiny book about Tesla. That's, that's the book you're counting. And then uh, soul in the game, which I would argue it's an investment book, but it's an investment in, in your life, which is the most important investment you can make. Um, so yes, so the and let me tell you the 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 key chapter, like the title chapter of the book, it's only game chapter. The idea for this concept came from Nassim Taleb. Nassim Taleb wrote this phenomenal book, and he's one of my favorite authors and thinkers, uh, called Skin in a Game. And in that book, and actually I have to talk to him about this. Actually, he had this chapter called Soul in a Game. And I don't know, to me, it felt like it was throwaway chapter. It was not, it was unimportant. It was just, it was just there because he like, kind of liked the idea of it, but it was not essential to the book. To me, that was the most important chapter in the book, period. I read this chapter and I, it was, I was stunned. So let's talk about skin in the game. Skin in the game is basically when you share an upside and downside with your customers. Okay, I'll give you a few examples. I am in the investment industry. My industry is so good at having no skin in the game. Like Wall Street will create a product that is toxic, that they would never buy for their mother or for themselves, but they would sell it to you with a smile. Okay, they have absolutely no skin in the game. Now, I run an investment firm. I'm a portfolio manager, you know, so... I buy, I own the same stocks my clients do. So I enjoy not just the upside of us, my firm collecting the fees, but also the downside of my decisions when we make mistakes or just the market, the market marks down our stocks. So my clients never have to question about, uh, if I have any conflicts of interest, if I was in, if I was in, if I was indifferent when I was making decisions on their behalf, because again, all of my liquid net worth and my, my wife and my kids and my brother invest in the same stocks they do. So that's, that's kind of the skin in the game. But let me give you two more examples. And uh, one is in the old times when engineer would build a bridge, after the, the, the bridge was built, he would stand under the bridge while the first uh, whatever, a car, whatever, a uh, carriage went over the bridge. So, because he, you want to make, you know, he wanted to make sure, you know, the engineers wanted to make sure that people see that they, can, they, this is like a, uh, that they have a skin in the game. Okay. They, you know, so they would not be able to sort of, you know, uh, it's almost like a, a perfect, perfect, and perfect analogy. Actually, just remember this Warren Buffett was asked, would he ensure uh, SpaceX for going to Mars? Like, would he, you know, and he had an interesting answer. He said there would be one price if Elon Musk was on board and there would, there would be another if he wasn't. And just think about this. I'm sure Elon Musk would work very hard to make sure that uh, an astronaut would not die on his rocket to Mars, right? We got that. But it's almost impossible for, for him to care as much about an astronaut as he cares about himself. 
It's just, it's our genetic programming. Or even worse, if it was one of his kids, though he has so many of them, like, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure about this anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that, that, that is what basically means having skin in the game. One last example, if you go to a restaurant and and the chef does not want to eat his own soup, I would have questions. I, I'm not sure I want to consume food in this restaurant. One of the things I was thinking about as you were saying skin in the game and our industry not eating their own cooking, so to speak. Mm -hmm. When they drink the Kool-Aid though, and they buy in to a really crappy product, that's when you have the financial crisis. When subprime is safe and risk-free and all the banks owned it, then you have a financial problem. But <laughs> that's, a, that's, I that's, a, that's a great point. That, that is, that's, that's a very good point, actually. I was thinking about, it. yeah, that's, that is a great point because at this point, they actually, um, so Warren Buffett has this, uh, tells this joke about oil men dying and going to heaven. He gets to heaven and he's been told, listen, you've actually been a good man and you deserve to go to heaven, but we are overbooked, so you have to go to hell. He said, he, the oil man says, you know what, are there any gatherings of other oil men here you know, right now? Maybe I can convince somebody to go to hell. They're like, you know, luck may have it. We have a, this oil man convention right now. So, you, yeah. Because, like, could I go talk to somebody at the oil convention? Maybe I'll convince somebody to go to hell, and then I can take the place. And St. Patrick says, sure. I mean, whatever. Not St. Patrick, whatever. The, the guy at the gate says, sure. Like, never happened before, but you can try. So, this oil man goes to the convention, and he says, hey, guys, they found oil in hell. And there is this stampede people of trampling over each other, you know, running to hell. And this guy is running after them. And the guy at the gate says, where are you going? He's like, but what if it's true? So the the point is like, you know, when talking about Kool-Aid, that's exactly, you know, that's a, uh, that's a, the, 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 that story describes it perfectly. Okay, so contrast the skin in the game versus soul in the game. And I want to bring up the fact that you you cite your father as an example because art was his North Star, not money. Yeah. Well, okay, so soul in the game is kind of a, it's a, a mental framework of elevation of skin in the game. So skin in the game is a foundational concept. So you need to have skin in the game. But soul in the game is where, so let's define what, what is soul and what is game. Soul is an activity that basically fits into one of the three criteria, maybe a combination of three. It's a, you, you spend a lot of time in this activity, your profession, for instance. Uh, it's meaningful to you. And it has a, it has an impact on others. Okay, those three factors. So you don't have to have all three of them, but if you know, one of if it touches one of the th one of the three, then that's that defines the game, okay? And you need to choose what is your game. How do you choose what the game? Something you are incredibly passionate about, something where money is your is a is a uh, is a secondary to you. So you would do this like what like I would do what I do. I I would in. You know, I'm lucky I get paid for what I do, but I would do this if even if I, even if I didn't get paid, or if I got paid a fraction of what you know I would get paid, because money is secondary to me. Okay, so it's a you know like investing for me or in writing. That's my game. That's something I absolutely love doing. It's part of my identity, and that's what really and soul. When I say soul in a game, that's your attitude towards that game. Um, it's inseparable from me. Like, you know, and, uh, that's, that's what soul in the game is basically. Yeah. And so my father, uh, and, um, when you have soul in the game, you have sacred taboos. And so my father, um, uh, you know, is an artist and was a teacher. Um, and he was, a he was, he taught at university in Russia and 
in Russia, bribery was uh, like tipping at Dennis. Like it's a, it was just part of your know, daily life. At Soviet Russia then, my father never took any bribes because he had a taboos that he would, you know, that he loved what he does so much that would violate his principles. Uh, another example, my father never painted anything he was not passionate about. There was a guy who came and ordered a painting for him to paint, and my father was not interested in that. And even though at the time that would be significant, significant amount of money, that subject matter was not interesting to him, so my father did not paint it, as an example, you know. You're in an enviable enviable position. I mean, it's it's a blessing to be in a job and a profession that you would do even if you got paid a fraction of the amount. I feel like there are so many people out there who don't like their job. They're not passionate about their job. Where do they go? Like, how do they pivot to figure out how can I follow a path of soul, having soul in the game? Well, I think it's a, I, it's a, it's a very difficult situation. I think you have to be very careful upfront when you pick your career. So you don't do it for money. Like, this is what I tell my kids. You, money should not, like, should be very secondary. You know, you want to make sure that you get, uh, you're not starving. But outside of that, money should be secondary because if you just pick a job because of financial benefits, you're going to have a very miserable life. And how much it pays, you're going to have a miserable, dull, uninteresting life. Um, now, I have a friend who, uh, when he was 35 years old, he decided he doesn't want to be an engineer anymore. And he, just, he really wanted to become a dentist. He, you know, he basically, when he, imagine 35 years old, he went to dental school, moved to California for three months, for three years, finished dental school. And now he is a very happy dentist. I mean, not everybody can do what he did. Um, but I, you know, and I, and I'm looking at, and I looked at him as he was, at the time I looked at him as he was crazy. And now, and I, but now I look at him as this incredible admiration. Um, so I think you constantly have to keep looking for this. And um, if you're miserable with your job, if you can f find where you have soul in the game and switch. I mean, it's a, again, it's easier said than done, but it's you know it, it, is, it is doable, and it's your life. And you only have, you only have only one life, so yeah. And even there are times when it may look on the surface like it's too late, but it may not be too late. Uh, there was a, uh, Confu uh, there's a saying by Confucius that I really, really love. Um, we, all, we all have two lives. The second one starts when you realize you only have one. And that's, that's really, so everything you do, you, should, you want to keep it in the back of your you know, mind that, you know, if you spend eight hours a day doing doing something absolutely hate, that's a third of your one life. It's a good one. You've brought up several times how things were very different, or yeah, how things were very different in Soviet Russia. Can you contrast for us a little bit what it was like in Russia as a kid versus when you came to the United States? Because you do say that you were born in Russia, made in America. Yeah, um, so, um, let's see. Okay, so um, okay, so let's start with the, how about uh, freedom of speech? Everything in newspapers was censored. Um, you did not hear about any crime because it was not reported. You, there was not a in your face discrimination, but there was plenty of kind of institutionalized discrimination. So. If you were Jewish, Georgian, or uh, Armenian, or Tajik, you were kind of, everybody looked at you as a second kind of second class citizen. So you were, there was almost like a caste system. Like it's nobody, it was not an official caste system, but you were, uh, but it was almost like a class, uh, caste system. Um, uh, the, there were very few choices. I grew up in this, uh, 
town of Murmansk. And uh, it only had three universities. And these universities had a very narrow range of professions. Like you could become a teacher, you become a seaman, or forget something else. But it was very, very narrow. So very few opportunities. Um, there was an enormous amount of corruption. It's a, like people became successful a lot of times, not because of the merit, but because how well they navigated in this whole system of bribery and, uh, you know, in the system of corruption. So, uh, it was, so it was a meritocracy, but merit was based on, uh, uh, on your skills in bribery and, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, so those are the things that come to mind. I mean, aside from the fact that my mom spent half of her day hunting for food in a grocery store because there was always a shortage of food. Um, but that's what, you know, that's kind of, I remember, you know, about growing up in Soviet Russia. What was it like coming to the United States and seeing like super sizing a Coke? So, so it's kind of interesting, kind of interesting. It's a huge contrast, right? You go, you come, you know, you come from Russia to the United States, you go to the grocery store and you realize drink, some people drink Coke as it was water. That's, and that's what I did the first three years I came to the United States. I consumed more Coke in the first three years in the United States than in the previous 19 years of my life in Russia. I mean, like, like it literally, because until I came to the United States, I only tried Coke once. So. I usually talk about positive aspects of this, but let me let me actually flip this a little bit. So United States has a lot of abundance, which is good, but not always, because this abundance I found like uh, could also be uh, dangerous, because just like I consumed, I consumed you know a gallon of Coke every you know every day, you know. That's not good. And so what happened was actually, when we think about, let's talk about Coke for a second. I was, I remember this day vividly. I was at a restaurant, Village Inn, and I ordered a third Coke. And I was drinking it and I realized I can't taste the, I can't taste the sweetness of it anymore. Because I've been drinking so much of it, my taste buds completely uh, got obliterated. And it just tasted like water, except it had a huge amount of sugar. Um, and this is when I decided that I'm only going to drink Coke on big occasions. And I think, you know, when I go to the movie theater, which I go maybe two or three or four times a year. And I tell you this, every single time now I drink Coke, I enjoy it so much more. So there is a, so when we have, so the abundance, we get used to abundance very quickly and we start, we stop appreciating it. And also material abundance, we, it gets even worse because then we become more materialistic and we start looking for happiness in goods, in material things. And th that happiness is very short lived. And we, we, we go through what's called the hedonic adaptation. We get used to good things very quickly. So, um, as I got older, I started to appreciate actually my wife had this conversation a couple of days ago and I read that uh, Asian wisdom, but though I think I also heard Michelangelo say the same thing, that the, uh, in the I think it's a Buddhist thing, where the art, like when somebody, you know, like in the, in the, in the Western culture, the art, the art, you take a blank piece of paper and you create art on it. In Asian culture, and then the Buddhist uh, uh, wisdom is that the art is already there. So when you look at the slab of uh, slab of uh, stone, uh, granite, or marble, the art is already there. You just have to unveil it. So I was talking to my life about my wife about this because I said we have so much art at home that we can create. And what I was referring to, we have so many, so many goods that we can just get rid of and give away just to create space. So, um, and, uh, Andy, I'm not even sure what the question I was answering, <laughs> but, but I, I would, I would argue that there is some volume of scarcity. You just got it from Marco Polo. 
who <laughs> that had to come from Asia, you know, Michelangelo. He... <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, no, because my, my Michelangelo said the same thing, but I also read that it's a Buddhist concept as well. So who knows? So when you came to the United States, did you see it besides being this land of bottomless soda? Did you see it as the land of opportunity and just so different from where you came? Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to oversimplify it with soda. Uh, no, no, absolutely. Um, I was lucky to be born in Russia and to be raised in America because I appreciated this country so much more. When you come from poor country, poor corrupt country to United States, I appreciate this country so much more because the, I saw the contrast. I saw the opportunity I could have here, which I didn't have in Russia. So all I knew that if I work harder and I had to work harder than everybody else because I didn't understand the culture, I didn't understand the language. But once I, once I kind of acclimated, um, I would argue that it became my competitive advantage. You know, and, uh, and I would argue that, you know, a lot of immigrants, and by the way, when I say this, I usually offend people who were born in this country and who are motivated as well. That's not what I'm trying to do. But, I, but, as, but as an immigrant, a lot of times people look at immigrants as they've been disadvantaged coming to this country. And, and I would argue, yes, maybe in the first year or two. But if they came from a poor country, I would argue that's actually an advantage long term. Well, certainly it gives you motivation and grit and perseverance. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't so easy for your father and your stepmother though, right? They had to make sacrifices and take jobs that were way below their education and their abilities. So I wrote about this on Twitter today. So let's, I wanna, I wanna, this is, thank you for this question because I think this is a very good question. When my, so we left Russia in 1991, the Soviet Union was collapsing. And my father was afraid that the country will fall into a civil war or it's going to go back to the dictatorial regime of the past. So he, we came to, he said that he, you know, uh, we came to United, to United States for us. And, and that's what he did. For the next 10, 15, 20 years, he, it seemed like, he, you know, that the bad things he thought would happen did not happen. Because Russia was going towards the democracy. There was a lot more opportunity, etc. And, um, my father made an enormous sacrifice because he was a professor at university. He was extremely well known in Murmansk, very, very respected. And, uh, and when he came to the United States, he was 58 years old, could not really learn language good enough to speak, like to, to teach, but he was lucky. He also had a hobby that he loved painting. And if you look behind me, all these paintings are my father's and you know, behind me. Um, so, what was interesting, so he, like when we left, were living in Russia, we were so concerned for him because he was giving up a lot. And we were concerned that he, was, he would be miserable here. He was lucky that he found, like he was able to switch from one love to another love. My stepmom was not as uh, fortunate because she was a doctor and she was 56 or something. And uh, so for her to become a doctor here was impossible. So she ended up uh, working at a hotel and doing housekeeping. Uh, and um, my father felt very bad about that actually. So he would come later in the day and would help my stepmom do housekeeping so she can take a break. That's, you know, that's my father. But anyway, this is where I was going with this. This is the point, like this, today I had this aha moment. I realized that what, when what the sacrifice my father did 30 years ago when we left Russia, even though like it's today, it's so obvious how much it has benefited my family. Aside from me living in this great country, don't get me wrong, but I was thinking about it. My, I have a 21 year old son who, if he lived in Russia today, he would have been conscripted to go to the Russian army and basically risk his life for what? 
and then also kill innocent, you know, he'll be forced to kill innocent Ukrainians. And I, like, if I lived in Russia, I hopefully would not be as brainwashed like everybody else. But then I don't know if I had the courage to speak up. And if I did, I'd probably be arrested and be in jail. So, so I am so glad that I'm, you know, for not just for me, but for my kids and, and my, my future and my, my grandkids and future generations that figure out, you know, that I'm growing up in this country, but not in Russia. So, and that's the, you know, that's, and I'm so thankful to, uh, to my father and my stepmom for their sacrifice. So it gives you such a great sense of gratitude. It sounds like. Uh, absolutely. No, absolutely. Vitaly, Soul in the Game is really a collection of essays with the goal of how to live life. It's like an instruction book for life. And I understand that the subject of Stoicism was a late addition to your book. How did you get into it? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the true, true story. So the, the book was almost done. I think I was working literally in the last chapter. And I was going like my you know was going back and forth with my editor, and we were basically done with the book. It's gonna you know it's gonna go into print probably in a few weeks or months or so. So it was almost done, and then I stumbled on Stoic philosophy, and it had a, such a huge impact on me. I emailed my editor. And I said, "Listen, I really want to explore this. I have no idea what's gonna lead to, but let's just put the book on hold for now. Let me just work on this." And I think I probably took a break for six months or more, and I started Stoic philosophy nonstop. That was my kind of, other than managing money, that was my single focus. And um, I ended up writing two significant sections in the book. I mean, there's probably well, maybe one third of the book now dedicated to Stoic philosophy. And that is the part of the book where I probably I learned the most, uh, and, you know, as uh, you know, when I finished the book. What... Did you ask me what brought me to Stoic philosophy? Epictetus. So let's let's first of all, Andy, let's define what is Stoic philosophy. So philosophy, as intimidating as that word sound, all it means it's a love or wisdom. That's it. That's what philosophy is. So and when we think about philosophy in general, we think about uh, this uh, kind of this granite sculptures of people whose names we can't pronounce who have these elaborate sayings and we can't understand. Well, Stoic philosophy, yes, it's 2,000 years old, started in Greece. And yes, there are statues of its founders that are in marble, but it's a, such an accessible, I would, I would argue, operating system for life. And uh, what brought me to this, well, one of its founders is uh, Epictetus, who was a slave. And he had this uh, mental model or framework called the economy of control. And to simplify it, whereas, you know, this whole dichotomy of control, it's very simple. It says, some things up, up to us, most, most things aren't. Okay, this, there's nothing, but what I told you so far, there's absolutely nothing earth, uh, earth shattering in this, except when, when you realize there are so few things that are up to us, so few things. It's basically, it's how we react, it's our values, it's our decisions, that's it. Everything else is not up to us. Andy, it's not up to us if you're not going to have continue have a broadband right now and be able to finish this recording or not. Not up to us. It's not up to us when you drive home today that you're gonna that every light you're gonna hit is gonna be red or green. Completely up to not up to you. Not, not up to us. It's not up to us if we go to a grocery store and the uh, grocery clerk is going to be rude to us. Completely not up to us. What's up to us is how we react to this. And, one, and by the way, it's not up to you what your wife tells you tonight. Not to you. Again, what's up to you how you, you react to what your wife tells you. Okay. So I'm, I'm not trying to make it about you, but I you know, but yeah, you know, why not? Uh, it's all about so, me. Yeah. So once once you recognize this, if it's not up to you, then you start you start reacting very differently. The only thing is up to you how you react to things. You 
start going through life very differently. And if it's not up to you, you know, uh, if you have a, a red light when you drive home, then you might as well just you know, kind of go with the flow and accept the way it is. There's nothing you can do about this. You can get upset about it, but it's still not going to change. You can get upset, you know, so you can be upset about the weather, but again, the weather is what it is. So anyway, this is kind of how I got into Stoic philosophy, and it's uh, been an, inc an incredible journey. I feel like Stoicism is gaining popularity. What do you think about Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic? Um, I think it's phenomenal. I think this is a uh, my son uses that, and I actually I I get Ryan's emails all the time, and I think it's a, it's a um, so this is important. Stoic philosophy, Stoic philosophy, probably we should probably call it Stoic practice. Okay, the reason for that is because there is a Asian proverb. Knowing and not doing is not knowing. If you know, if you read Stoic, you know, Ryan's books or my book about Stoic philosophy, but you don't practice it, you really, it's almost like you're not knowing it. Because, Sto you know, with Stoic philosophy, what you're trying to do, you're trying to reprogram your behavior that you, you know, your habits that you have created for decades. So it requires a daily, like I guess daily stoic, a daily practice. Or, you know, and uh, so uh, I, I'm glad Ryan is doing it and I'm, you know, very thankful to him. You know, it's scary. I feel like we often feel that we've come so far because I have my smartphone, we're podcasting, we have broadband. We feel like so far removed from the ancient Romans and ancient Greece. But then you read about Stoicism and the writings and philosophies of these people. And in our 21st century, I still can't control my emotions or how I interpret external events. Like I haven't, we haven't come that, I haven't evolved that far because all those writings still apply to what we do today. So, um, <laughs> So this is what so incredible about Stoic philosophy and incredible about when you read uh, Seneca, Epictetus, or Marcus Aurelius, because you feel like they are writing for you today, even though it's been written two thousand years ago. So because we haven't changed, like it takes hundreds of thousands of years for us to change. And it's only 2,000 years past. So what's interesting is that there was a, I remember reading um, Seneca's uh, discussion about how we as humans are get distracted by all these different things, how we can't concentrate on one thing, and we have all these interruptions. And remember, he was writing 2,000 years ago before Instagram, iPhone, and Netflix, right? He was like, he was writing it when... Uh, where the Facebook was the carvings on a stone. Like, like it's a, it's a, <laughs> so we haven't really changed. So when, when you read his, when you, when, when, the read, when you read Stoic Wisdoms, you realize that it applies today as much as it did 2,000 years ago. That's, that's, that's I wanna why. Read, yeah. I want to read this passage from your book. It talks about, the Stoics viewed money as an external advantage. The goal, however, is not to acquire as many external advantages as possible, but to use them wisely. When we think about wealth, the word that usually comes to mind is more, but the Stoics flip traditional wisdom upside down. Their insight is that once our basic needs are satisfied, the easiest way to create wealth is to want less. Can you talk about what you know about stoicism and defining money? Yeah, um, no, I think that's, I, it's, to be honest, that you, you just summarized my whole thinking on the subject, really, that, that, that quote did. Yes, because that is exactly how Stoics approach it. You know, they, uh, uh, I think, I forget which one of them said that uh, happiness from, comes from wanting what you have. 
And it's really up to you to decide what you want. Think about it. It's your choice. It's, a, it's your choice to decide what you want. And um, a lot of times we are mindlessly uh, decide to want you know, what our neighbors have. And then we get into this rat race of trying to get more and more and more and own, have uh, what our neighbors have. And that's going to lead to a uh, life of misery. Because you're just gonna you're gonna spend a lot of time working very very hard to accumulate things that's gonna bring you very little satisfaction. Um, as I got older, as I mentioned, I find a lot less uh, like I'm become actually more minimalist. Like uh, not quite, but I I I found that I enjoy material things less less and less, and I I wanna have a simple life. Uh, I was talking to a friend who just bought a house in Florida and he was raving about this. And I and I told him I have so little desire to have a second home in Florida because now I have to think about hurricanes and a flood insurance and whatever other things he has to worry about. And I'll just be very happy to use Airbnb just to keep my life simple. Because there is a, by the way, there is a lot of value in simplicity as well. Um, so, so value, so money is, uh, you know, so more money does not bring you happiness. After we get above a certain level of income, the incremental dollar does not make us any happier. You know, uh, money does buy security. But again, it's, it doesn't even matter how much money you make. Like the, the how much money you make in itself is not as important. It's, it's, it's a multivariable equation. How about this? Uh, your wealth is really is is it's really just you know your income minus your expenses and then accumulated over the years, right? So either you make a hundred thousand dollars and spend sixty, or you make five million dollars and spend seven. You know you will be wealthier at the end when you make hundred thousand dollars and say you know and save you know, and spend sixty because you're gonna keep saving forty thousand dollars a year. And you're going to invest over a period of time. It's going to compound. And it's going to, and you're going to accumulate wealth. So, wanting to make, you know, making more money, making more money. That's usually how we look at uh, our solving problems. It's not. It's actually maybe part of a solution. Where another part of the solution we usually ignore is to be mindful about how we spend money, and actually wanting what we buy. Well, we live in such a material world that we find that if you look around your house, I could get rid of most of the things in my house and I wouldn't miss a lot of them. Like if I only kept the things that really mean something to me or have a utility, I could probably reduce things. Like I could get rid of 70% 70, 70 of my stuff and I'd be okay. I'd probably be happier. Exactly as 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 as, as, I, as I told you before, this is what I, my wife and I now we approach our house as an art project, where we are trying to create art at home by getting rid of half of our possessions. And I and I, honest to God, I think it's just gonna, you know, it's just gonna make a. It's actually gonna bring us happiness because we won't be stumbling through twenty different dishes to get to one. You know, just you know. Uh, so yeah, so I uh, there there is a lot of value in simplicity, and uh, simplicity and and not being burdened by a lot of things. Since we're on the topic of stoicism, I wanted to ask you about absolute power and unlimited wealth. Can you talk about why you're most impressed by Marcus Aurelius? Oh yeah. So if you ask me who would I want to have lunch, dead or alive, it would be Marcus Aurelius. Because every stoic, like, you know, Pictetus impresses me because he, has, he was a slave and yet he had so much wisdom. Uh, Seneca was this Renaissance man centuries before Renaissance. But Marcus Aurelius, and by the way, all of their, you know, all of them have so much wisdom. So there's, every single one of them has this um, f uh, this has a wealth of knowledge. So I'm not, I don't want to take uh, take away from any one of them, except Marcus Aurelius was 
the wealthiest, the most powerful man in the Western world at the time. He had unlimited power, unlimited wealth, and yet he did not let that wealth and power corrupt him. Which is it's a which is an incredible, incredible test. Because what happens with power, um sometimes you start taking shortcuts. Let me let me give you an example, and it's not a perfect example. Um but let's talk let's let's take Putin for example. Okay? And I'm gonna give him a benefit of the doubt a little bit. So maybe when he came to power, he was actually I read, you know, uh, I read interviews with people who knew him. He was actually kind of, even though he came from KGB, there was, you know, he was somewhat had democratic values to somebody. He wanted to have democratic values. But over time, and, 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 you could, and he argued that for him to achieve this, he needed more power. And, and I get this because when he became, you know, when he came, you know, Russia was very corrupt. And so, there was a lot of um, um, uh, there was a lot of local elected leaders who were very corrupt. So he figured he needed to centralize his power to get rid of corruptions. So he asked for more power from Russian citizens, and they said, "We get it. We'll give it to you." Then he asked for more power and more power. And then what happens is that let's say you want to accomplish something, and and you and the democratic process is too slow, or it may actually not cooperate with you. So you start taking shortcuts because you're doing it for the good of the people, right? This is how you convince yourself. Every shortcut you take, you become a little bit more corrupt. You just don't realize it. You, you start abusing power a little bit more. And at some point, it gets to the point where all you're trying to do is just to preserve the power you have, because now you're addicted to it. So Marcus Aurelius, it was like Putin on steroids because he had, he was given unlimited amount of power from the very, from, from day one, and he still behaved, he never abused it. And to me, that is like, that's like the biggest test, he'd been subjected to one of the biggest tests ever. It's a bigger test than poverty. Um, and he passed it. Yeah, it's a rare individual who can pass that test. Yeah. I'd like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Um, I think it's a, it's a relative for everybody. For me, it's basically living a meaningful life, be, being kind to people. Just basically living according to my values, basically. That's, that's for me, success. When I look in the mirror and I like the person I see, that's, that's a success. I mean, I mean, not like how much hair I have, but that's not, I'm not, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. I just, you know, to respect the person I see in the mirror. Well, Vitaly, thank you for sharing your insights on investing, on a stoic philosophy, uh, I urge all the inspired listeners and viewers to check out your newest book, Soul in the Game, The Art of a Meaningful Life. Tell tell everyone where they can follow you and get more. Yeah. So if you decide to get the book, uh, once you buy the book, go to soulinthegame.net for two reasons. First of all, you can subscribe to my articles, which are absolutely free. And also, since the book came out, I already wrote four chapters, four new chapters, and you can get them there absolutely free. There are instructions there how to get it. And also, I keep writing. I keep, you know, I keep writing new stuff. I'm rethinking and changing my thinking on some things. Uh, so you can, you know, you can get new chapters as I keep writing them. You can get my articles. Um, also, um, I have a podcast. It's a lazy man's podcast. Unlike your podcast, I basically, my articles are read to you by a narrator. So you don't have to listen to my voice all the time, which is a good thing. Um, and so if you go to investor.fm, like FM radio, investor.fm, or simply if you just look for intellectual investor on the podcast, any podcast app, you can subscribe to my podcasts. And what you do, once you subscribe to it, you can go back and binge listen to 167 episodes that, you know, they're there. So that's, <laughs> you can do that too. And I should mention that this is all, 
this is all about you doing the things that you love and outsourcing what you don't want to do because you want to maximize your time and effort oh, abs oh, absolutely. and live a meaningful life. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, just one little example. Um, there was a good reason why my articles are read to you, not by me, because I really just don't enjoy doing it. I love writing them. I don't, I don't like reading them out loud. So we 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 found this terrific guy Elliot in Canada, who's been reading my articles to uh, you know for our podcast for the last three and a half years, and people love him. And by the way, there is an audible version of the book, as well, uh, Soul in a Game. And Elliot reads that book too. You know, it's on audible as well. He recorded the book for us as well. So uh, exactly. So if you find something where I where I, if I find something where I add very very low, very little value, and something I don't like doing. I outsource it. The valuable lesson. Thank you, Vitaly. It's my pleasure, Andy. Thank you so much. So what was your favorite inspired money moment? I love that Vitaly is a lifelong learner. He enjoys investing because it's a journey that has no end. I agree 100%. The art and craft of investing is a terrific learning experience. If you've ever bought a stock, you know that it can be humbling too. Are you pursuing things in your life and job that you deeply love? Do you have soul in the game? Are you doing things that you'd be happy to do for no compensation at all? Ponder that for a bit. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, please post a comment or share it in the Inspired Money Makers Facebook group at inspiredmoney.fm slash Facebook. Thank you for tuning in to the end. If you need help with financial planning, your investments, or setting up a 401k retirement plan for your business, schedule a call with me by going to inspiredmoney.fm slash call. That's inspiredmoney.fm slash C-A-L-L. Runnymede Capital Management is my company. We're fee-only, family-owned, and provide objective advice. Schedule a no-obligation call today. Thank you for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.